Hello, my name is Sean Bragan. I'm the managing partner at BGA Insurance. I want to thank everyone for attending what I think is going to be a, a great webinar. Uh, today we have Noah, Ro Noah Rosenfarb and Peter Culver of Freedom, uh, Freedom, Freedom Family Office. Um, they have some what I think real cutting edge ideas to save on capital gains taxes and income taxes for some of your high net worth clients. Um, you know. Please use the uh, chat box to ask any questions along the way, and then we'll open it up for, for comments at the end. And uh, if you're not muted, please mute yourself so we can uh, get through this. But um, without further ado, no, I think you can uh, get started on this. Awesome. Well, thank you guys uh, for having me. And here we are. You can see our faces. I popped in the chat if you want to just let us know where you're zooming in from. Uh, looking forward to having everyone here and hopefully sharing some information with you that's of value that you haven't heard before. Uh, I, I can't control the slides here, so I'm not sure how to advance them. I don't know, Thresh, is that something I could figure out how to do? Thank you. So one of the things that we wanted to talk about was unique ideas. And I think for those of you that are here on the call, it looks like you're coming in from all around the country. Uh, love to know where you get your unique ideas from. And most of the times what we hear is that, especially the entrepreneurial clients that we serve, they expect their accountant to give them ideas. And that's really, unfortunately, not always the best place to look uh, because entrepreneurs, are, which is our client base, and for those of you on the call, you know, those of you that have W2 clients, we have some ideas that we'll share that might be applicable for them. Uh, but Presumably all of you as, as producing agents likely have your own small business as well. If you're relying on your accountant, one of the challenges is that most of us think of accountants as people that are conservative. So I'm a third generation CPA and uh, not only my father and my grandfather, but also my father-in-law is a CPA. And in general, I would say accountants are a conservative type. Uh, but not everybody's as conservative as their accountant. So you want to think through your own audit risk tolerance, meaning how likely are you to defend yourself in an audit and how comfortable would you be taking a position that the IRS may disagree with? And that's a concept that most taxpayers have not thought about in the past. They kind of just adopt whatever their CPA tells them. So if they decide to deduct a, a business vehicle, their accountant may tell them about uh, you know, bonus depreciation and they could buy a Tesla Model X or a Cadillac Escalade and deduct at, at one point in time, 100% of the cost of that vehicle, as long as they're using it for business. Well, are you really using it exclusively for business? Do you have to think about how many miles you're driving for your company versus personally? Well, those are the things that you would think about around your audit risk tolerance? Do you want to take a deduction that the IRS might disagree with? And the way that I evaluate if a deduction is worth taking or, or tax position is worth taking, is I want to think about the consequences of a disagreement. So if I take a position on my tax return and the IRS is going to end up disagreeing with me, there have to be a few things that happen before we get to that point. So one is I have to be selected for audit. So in the uh, US, right now the IRS is auditing around 2% of taxpayers that are making under $400,000 a year of adjusted gross income. And they're auditing about 6% of taxpayers that are making over $1 million a year of income. So if you're reporting a million dollars or more of income, there's an over 90% chance that they're not even gonna look. So that's, that's number one. So now let's assume they are going to look at your tax return. Now the question is, are they going to look at the line item? Because usually they're not looking at every single thing that you've done. They want to select some line items. And maybe your vehicle expense might be the line item that they select, but maybe it's not. So the next thing is they're going to disagree with you. And when they disagree with you, and you, you can't come to a reasonable conclusion and the IRS is essentially stating what is gonna happen. They're gonna look for you to pay the taxes that you would have paid had you not taken that deduction. 
So that's essentially a wash because if you did it the way they wanted you to do it in the first place, you would have paid the taxes already. So you didn't lose any money from that. The second thing they're going to do is charge you interest from the date that you should have paid the tax to the date that you actually pay the tax. And the IRS is not a hard money lender. They, they charge a very reasonable interest rate. So if you've given your clients good advice and they've made wise investments, they should have been able to accumulate interest on the taxes that they saved. And, and so that's essentially a wash as well. The third area is the only area that's punitive, and that's where the IRS can assess a penalty. And the penalties can be significant. So if your client or you wants to take a tax position that has a significant consequence to your tax uh, position, you may want to get what's called a tax opinion letter. And this is a letter that's going to be written by a tax lawyer that says that you are more likely than not to have this tax structure or this deduction upheld in the event of an audit. And when you have that letter, they can't charge you a penalty. So with that in mind, a lot of entrepreneurs, when they're familiar with what the consequences are for a disagreement, they realize, wait a minute, it's not much worse than not having done the thing in the first place. And the second thing that you've got to think about when you're looking at unique ideas is what your tolerance for complexity is. And for those of you that sell premium finance life insurance or, you know, complex split dollar pension uh, insurance structures. Anytime you're doing that, there's a level of complexity that you have to deal with to explain to the client about the parties that are involved. And the same is true sometimes with these tax structuring ideas that we're going to share today. There's a certain amount of complexity that you have to tolerate to get the result. What I say, uh, you know, certainly I use myself as an example. I pay very little in taxes, but my situation is very complicated and, and requires an investment of time, effort, and attention to avoid the tax. So the more willing you are to tolerate complexity, the less in tax you're likely to be able to pay. So let me share an idea with you, if I could advance the slide here, Thresha. Uh, called the wealth preservation planning approach. And this is a very interesting, unique novel idea that was invented by our former chief tax strategist, a tax lawyer, um, along with a co-inventor who's a CPA out of a CPA firm in the New England. And essentially it's, one, it's a one-stop structure for people typically when they're selling their business. And typically those business interests are C-corporation business interests, or partnership interests. So we'll go one more slide. I don't know, Thresh, if there's a way I could control the slides, it'd be even better. But we've got uh, three structures that are combined together and weaved in a unique way to create the outcome that the client's looking for. And the outcome is going to be tax protection. Uh, so you're not gonna pay capital gains tax, ordinary income tax, uh, and, and if properly structured, any estate tax and asset protection as well. And the way we're doing that is through three vehicles, a trust and, and the area of the trust law that we're uh, relying on is a 75 year old, um, you know, 75 year long case history on the type of trust that we use. A holding company, which many of you might be familiar with, is just a container to hold assets. So no operations inside that holding company, but it's uniquely structured in such a way and weaved together with a life insurance product, a private placement life insurance product. And when you put these three structures together, what you get, as I mentioned, is pretty powerful. So we'll go one more slide. Uh, yeah, one more. So what, what we typically do if someone's approaching us, usually a year in advance of the sale of their business, what we're doing is creating this wealth preservation trust structure, and we're gifting the business interest into the trust. The trust will be for the benefit of the family members of the owner, which could potentially include themselves. We have a transaction that is likely to take place in 2024. And so in 2023, uh, in this particular instance, the husband owned 100% of the business, but prior to the end of 2023, he transferred to his spouse 20% of the interest in the business. And now in 2024, the spouse is taking that 20% interest that she holds and contributing it to a wealth preservation trust for the benefit of her husband through what many of you would refer to as a spousal lifetime access trust 
or SLAT. So now the Wealth Preservation Trust has this relationship with a private placement life insurance policy. Some of you may be familiar with that from your insurance expertise, but private placement life insurance policies are uniquely designed uh, typically with $5 million or more worth of premium going in. And in this case, the business interest or the appreciated asset actually gets weaved through so that the proceeds from the sale will get contributed into the PPLI. And the client, will own the policy through their trust, and they will be able to take money out of that trust as often as they need it through loans. So again, we're not gonna be able to dive into a, a detailed analysis of any one situation, but if we advance a slide, I'll share with you the number example. So let's assume your client's selling a business for $10 million. They're only gonna pay a 24% tax. I see some of you in California, uh, that number might be significantly higher into the mid 30s or, or even close to 40% in some cases. But let's assume just a 24% tax. So if they're going to pay the tax and invest their capital, they're going to have 7.6 million net. We're going to grow that money at 8% uh, if you're paying the tax. And if you're not paying the tax, if you're using this approach, there's some additional fee drag. So you actually are only going to get a 7% return. Uh, we use a blended tax rate of 35% on appreciation to account for interest income and dividend income and capital gains. And let's assume that your client wants to take out 30,000 a month. Well, what would be the difference? Let's advance to the next slide. So this is on the left-hand side, if you use this wealth preservation planning approach versus paying the tax and investing on the right-hand side. And what you could see is over the course of 30 years, if both parties took out $30,000 a month, the person who decided to use this wealth preservation planning approach, despite getting a 1% lower return on investment because of the fee drag, they have almost four times the money. And the reason is that when you don't pay taxes, you have the opportunity to compound your money on the money that you didn't have to give up to the government. So in incredibly effective strategy for those of you that have clients selling a business, uh, we'd, we'd welcome the opportunity to walk you through whether or not this would be applicable to your situation. So love to turn it over to Peter, who can walk us through some of the uh, remaining slides. And if you have some questions, I'll be able to attend to the chat. In here. So obviously the strategy that Noah just described in its you know fullness saves or eliminates three taxes, the capital gains tax on the sale itself. The PPLI, as probably most of you on the call know, operates first like an IRA in that if the sale proceeds are inside the PPLI, the investment, the reinvestment, the interest, the capital gains are not taxable while they're in there. If you withdraw the money by policy loans, they're also not taxable and the structure that Noah just showed involves having the PPLI and therefore the sale proceeds inside a dynasty trust. So it can be structured to avoid capital gains, income, and estate taxes. So that's uh, you know pretty all-encompassing strategy. What we wanted to spend a little bit more time on is we have a list. This is a comprehensive list of a variety of strategies that uh, on a more tactical or isolated basis help uh, entrepreneurs and high income owners. Uh, I'm not gonna go through every single one. I thought I would focus on two, which are shown I think on the next page, which are specifically designed for people who make big incomes. And those big incomes could be either W-2 earners or non-W-2 earners. Uh, so one is in a recent piece of legislation known as the uh, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, gets confusing because that's IRA too. Uh, there is a component of that, which is often referred to as the infrastructure provisions. And there are a whole variety of tax incentives for infrastructure. One of them is specifically related to solar. And essentially what it provides is that people who invest in solar installations, equipment, get two benefits. One, they get an accelerated depreciation deduction 
that is not dissimilar to accelerated depreciation uh, on investment real estate, if you're familiar with that. The real bonus in solar is that the legislation also provides for a tax credit. So if you're familiar with how your tax return <laughs> works, you know, the, de the depreciation comes off your earnings and helps reduce your earnings in the process of calculating your tax, but the credit goes dollar for dollar against your tax. Uh, it is also the case in certain situations that if you invest enough in the strategy and actually generate more of a credit than you could use in the initial year, you can carry the credit back and essentially file an amended return, take the benefit of the excess deduction, excuse me, excess credit, and reduce your tax in a prior year. And although the math is slightly different in each case, through that combination of accelerated depreciation deduction and the credit, for every dollar you invest in the strategy, you're going to generate about a dollar fifty worth of tax savings. Uh, so that's a strategy, uh, and comes right out of the legislation. So not particularly uh, adventurous. Uh, another strategy that we use a lot with our clients that have high income is a charitable giving strategy where essentially uh, we have business relationships with a number of uh, sponsors in this field where simplistically we're able to acquire a commodity at a discounted value to its actual fair market value that then enables the investor to contribute uh, the property at its fair market value. Uh, and essentially the, the, the delta there or the leverage is for about every dollar that you would invest, you'd get uh, a $4 deduction. And maybe to use some actual math, imagine you or your client made a million dollars in a current year. When you make contributions of in-kind property as opposed to cash or securities, you can only make a charitable contribution up to 30% of your AGI. So if you made a million bucks, you could make a charitable contribution of up to $300,000. But through this strategy, you could make that charitable contribution by only writing a check for $75,000. So a pretty powerful strategy. The higher tax state that you live in, the more powerful it is. So we see a lot of people on the call uh, live in California. So it could be particularly uh, advantageous. And uh, so those are two. Uh, if you got us wound up, we could go on for another two hours, but we thought we would just give you a little bit of a flavor of you know, going back to the beginning, even though the first strategy is multifaceted, usually the triggering event is someone's about to sell a business and they're going to have a huge capital gain. What can I do to address that strategy that Noah described has the additional benefits he laid out? This strategy and some of the other ones in this piece, which we can send to you, are more key to, oh, I'm going to have a really big income this year. What can I do to address that that high income? So maybe pause there. No, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to those or any other ones, but love uh, to. Maybe Fresh, could you just go back one screen just so people could read it while we talk and, and solicit sure. some questions? For anybody that has a question, feel free to pop it into the chat. Uh, I know we- I have we'll a, a question, Noah. You, you mentioned earlier about, um, first off, how you deal with CPAs. And what I found over my 32 years of career is 
most CPAs, when you show them an idea that they're not familiar with, their, their typical response is no, don't do it because they have no incentive to say yes, right? There's really no incentive for the CPA to say yes on any new idea that they don't understand. But you described- Or didn't invent. That, okay. Okay, the IRS, if you take one of these ideas and you're one of the unlucky few that get audited, uh, you're going to pay the tax that you would have paid. You're going to pay the some interest on that tax, but it's not exceedingly large interest. And the worst scenario is a penalty tax. But you said that if you have a legal opinion, you don't have to pay the, the, the yeah. penalty tax. I've never heard of that. Yeah, it's an amazing thing that most people don't know is there's a, a subsection of the tax code that says if you as a taxpayer before filing your tax return get what's called a tax opinion letter and tax opinion letters are most often written by tax lawyers and if so if you get a tax lawyer to write an opinion letter the standard that that has to meet is what's called more likely than not so the tax lawyer looks at the structure or the deduction that you've taken and they write a letter that says you are more likely than not to have this deduction or structure upheld after scrutiny of the IRS. And as long as you have that letter, the IRS can't charge you a penalty. That's fantastic. And I assume these strategies you're talking about, you're getting these tax opinion letters for. It, it, you can. It depends. So like I, I posted in the chat a link to dualharvest.org, right. which is where uh, clients can purchase seeds and then donate them a year later. So in that particular strategy, uh, and on that landing page, we have a memo that you could print out and hand to a CPA. And in there, we outline the five cases where the IRS has attempted to deny a taxpayer this deduction, and they were uh, you know, over overruled. And so taxpayers have clear case law that you can purchase a commodity with the intent to donate it in 12 months, at a higher valuation and get that deduction. So we don't think a, a tax opinion letter is a good investment, but if a client wanted to, they could get one. Okay. We have a question here. Can uh, the private placement life insurance strategy be used for a large capital gain of a stock? Yeah. Sure. It does. can be. Yeah. That's and that it. stock could be closely held stock or it could be publicly traded stock. Uh, we had one case we looked at where the client owned Apple and they right. had a, a very large Apple position. But in the end, they decided they just wanted to keep their Apple stock, which <laughs> probably proved to be a prudent decision. Um, right. And then I see, John, you have this question around the, you can't use an opinion letter provided by the promoter. So all opinion letters have to be addressed to the taxpayer. Right. So often in, in uh, when you're, when you see one of these promoted concepts, some of the concepts that we've described today, the promoter may have an opinion letter that was written on behalf of an individual client that's really used for you to get comfort that if you want a letter, here is this lawyer that has already gone through this and will write a letter, oftentimes at a discount because they're writing multiple letters on the same strategy to multiple taxpayers. So if you want an opinion letter from someone that's never seen the structure before, like our Wealth Preservation Trust, you might pay $75,000 to $150,000 to get that letter. But because we have a lawyer that's familiar with the strategy that prepares a custom letter for each taxpayer, usually it's it could be obtained for, again, depends on the strategy. In some high volume strategies, it could be as low as $2,500. In some lower volume strategies, it could be as high as you know $25,000. But, but again, it's a, where you'd not just be getting one letter for one person for one idea. Got it. Um, and then um, a lot of people, when they think of private placement life insurance, they're thinking you need to be FINRA registered. And if they're not, they can't be compensated on the product. Uh, it, tell me if I'm wrong, but we're talking about an offshore private placement product that you do not need to be FINRA registered to be compensated on. Is that correct? Uh, I don't believe so yep. because it's onshore, right, Peter? We're not using any right. offshore PPLI. We use yeah. we use an onshore PPLI. Okay. But right. Uh, the, um, I, you'd have to ask uh, Peter, I'm not sure about how the compensation works on that PPLI. Yeah. I mean, I think we've, I mean, I'm 65. Um, it's an interesting question. Uh, I yeah, think we're, we're both life licensed and, right. and securities licensed as a registered investment advisor, not a broker dealer. So okay. 
Uh, but, but when it comes to the fees and that type of product, usually the client is going to be paying a third party manager to manage the assets inside the plan. And that's where if you are a financial advisor, that's usually where your compensation is going to come from more so than the yes. commission the PPLI side. Okay. Yeah, usually the, in like that structure that if you imagine someone sold a business, the proceeds were captured inside the PPLI, and then those assets are managed by an asset manager. The PPLI insurer is going to charge a fee to set up, administer the policy. The asset manager would charge a separate fee to manage the assets. And there's, there's a minimum case size for... Uh, these cases, like the, the PPLI, uh, I mean, they, there's a minimum premium. And so you, you got to be looking at pretty decent sized cases. Wh where's your your threshold for this? You know, what's a typical case size? And, you know, what's the minimum case size on, on these ideas? I mean, I think most of the insurers we work with, and remember one thing, so private placement life insurance, these are not, you know, retail products. And so the client, the investor, typically has to be an accredited investor, right? So uh, now most of the cases we work on, the carrier has a minimum premium of $5 million. So they're for big cases, no question about it. And then when it comes to some of the other things we shared, like the solar tax credits, right or the dual harvest program, usually it's around a million dollars or greater of adjusted gross income. If you're a California taxpayer, uh, you know, and if and you're single, then maybe it's something like $600,000, but usually we're looking at seven figure, eight figure income, you know, seven figures and up. And they are, they're tremendously more beneficial in high tax states. I was on a call yesterday, client had sold a business, but they live in Florida. So probably the max they're going to pay is 20, 23%. When you do the math, you're just not getting the leverage that you might get if you lived in New York, Massachusetts, New Jersey, California. Those are probably the top hit parade, maybe a few other ones. So especially in California, because You've got high tax to start with. I believe there's a premium income tax if you make over a million bucks, something like that. So the potential tax gets super, super high. So then the leverage is even more valuable. Yeah, if the taxes get pretty ugly here in California, I'll tell you that. Um, so you mentioned that you typically want like a, a year in advance uh, before the client is maybe going to sell that highly appreciated property. Um, that's because we're setting up your trust. You're setting up a holding company. And then I guess you, there's the underwriting re involved in the private placement life insurance. So you just need some leeway before you do the transaction. Correct. And, and, you know, usually a year in advance, a tax year in advance is ideal. If it's right. the same tax year, then it becomes a bit of a timing situation, in part because your valuation, you want some separation between the valuation of your gift to the sale of the asset, right? And, and there's some relatively new case law that came out around that, especially related to charitable contributions. So you, you, you want to, the, the more distance, the better. We do have some emergency, you know, solutions <laughs> when somebody comes in for triage. We had one this year. He called me, I think, right after Thanksgiving. He had sold the business with a $20 million capital gain, a California resident. He had sold it in the end of March, reached out to me after November, you know, because he didn't know that he should call sooner. And right. uh, we've been able, we, I think we did uh, one strategy that'll save him about a million and a half dollars in 2023. Then we have another strategy that we'll be using that could save him, you know, a couple million dollars in 2024. Uh, by by going back and amending prior year tax returns with a tax carryback uh, related to those solar tax credits. So it's never too late, but uh, I mean, if you pay the taxes, it's too late. But it, be before you pay the tax, before you file the return, there might still be some things you could do. Okay, uh, John, 
John had a question about how the cap gain on the sale of the business is deferred by contributions of the Wealth Preservation Trust. It's actually even better than that, John, because it's not deferred, it's avoided. And uh, and the way that's done is, is through a clever construction of having the grantor of the trust be your private placement life insurance policy. And so the grantor is the taxpayer for any taxes owed. And in this case, the taxpayer is a non-taxable entity. So, so you really just do not pay tax. And I'll I'll share a similar but different structure. Um, I, I have a business in Puerto Rico that I own, uh, which pays a 4% corporate tax rate. That business is owned by my Roth 401k plan. So when that business has income and, and pays its 4% tax and then issues a dividend, the dividend goes to the owner, but the owner is a tax-free 401k plan happens to be a Roth. So no tax on the dividend, no tax on the accumulated, uh, you know, interest capital gains that go get invested from the plan proceeds after the dividend. And then of course, whenever I take that capital out, I won't pay any tax either. And if I end up selling that business, there'd be no capital gains tax, just like any business that's sold in a 401k plan. So we have other tricks up our sleeve. If any of you have unique cases where our advice would be uh, wise to obtain. We'd welcome the opportunity to chat with you directly about your individual client set of circumstances. And you right. can learn more about us at talktofreedom.com. All right. Um, helpful? Very helpful, very helpful. And um, if anyone wants to get a hold of uh, Peter or Noah, you know, feel free to give me a call or shoot me an email. I'll be more than happy to uh, get you guys together, see if we can't find yep. some opportunities uh, to uh, help some of your clients. And um, if yeah, you... I guess whatever you do, and this is kind of the way we look at it, is if we can help a client save a lot of money on taxes, it means they have some more liquidity to maybe do some more business with us, whatever that business is, right? So we'd love to help you help yourselves and your clients by you know, getting into some of these strategies in more detail. All right. Well, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Noah. Um, if anyone needs any additional details on this, shoot me an email. Uh, I, that was in the chat room. It's Sean B at BGAinsurance.com. And I can send you uh, a copy of this uh, webinar. And thanks for thanks arranging for Sean and having us on. And behind the curtain, our colleague, Thresha, thanks for doing all the tech behind the scenes. All right. Thank you. All right. All right. Bye, everybody. Take care.